Uh, thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, I'm glad that we have Dr. Hanna uh, presenting her talk about uh, intelligent Wi-Fi communication. Dr. Hanna is with uh, the University of Glasgow. Uh, before joining the University of Glasgow, she was with uh, Strathclyde, and before that with the University of Edinburgh. Uh, she had she did her PhD on Wi-Fi technology, and then she joined the University of Edinburgh Wi-Fi Center. Uh, working on advancing uh, Wi Fi technology again. And uh, today, uh, she's going to present for us a uh, cutting edge technology actually on intelligent Wi Fi services. Thank you, Diana. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having me today. It's really a great pleasure to be uh, presenting to you. Uh, my talk will be about intelligent Wi Fi communications. And Uh, I'm visiting you today from Scotland, a country of uh, beautiful heritage, amazing nature, lakes with uh, mysterious monsters, and also the most beautiful and cute cow that you could see anywhere, which we call the hairy coop in Scotland. Uh, I started my postdoctoral uh, career at the University of Edinburgh, uh, where I worked in the Wi Fi Research and Development Center. And then I moved to Glasgow in the University of Strathclyde. And currently, I am an assistant professor in the University of Glasgow. A little bit about the university uh, it was established in the year 1451, making it the fourth oldest university in the English speaking world after Oxford, Cambridge, and St. Andrews. Uh, it is uh, ranked in the top 100 universities in the world, and it is a member of the uh, prestigious Russell Group Universities of uh, Research Intensive Institutions in the United Kingdom. And currently it has around uh, 29,000 uh, undergraduate and graduate students and a global community of more than 219,000 alumni. And I come from the James Watt School of Engineering, uh, which is proud to be the first institution to offer a degree in engineering in the United Kingdom. And uh, according to the uh, Research Excellence Framework 2021, it is in the top uh, five in Scotland, uh, in the UK for engineering research output and the top in Scotland for engineering research excellent. And also it's in the third uh, in the UK in the electrical and electronic engineering. And it has witnessed some of the uh, greatest minds of all time, uh, such as uh, Sir James Watt, uh, Sir uh, Lord uh, Kelvin, and also uh, John Bridget Bird, who's the inventor of the television. My uh, group that I work in is called the Communication Sensing and Imaging Group, uh, which is led by Professor Mohammed Imran, and it contains more than 110 researchers from more than uh, 25 nationalities. Uh, uh, due to the talent of the people in this group, we have a funding portfolio of around 20 million pounds, and we work uh, intensively with industry as well as with our academic collaborators uh, from all over the globe. And among the uh, areas of research that our group focus on, uh, uh, we work on uh, signal processing for wireless communications. Uh, we have people with expertise on uh, fabrication of uh, antennas and intelligent reflecting surfaces, and also on uh, free space optical communication and uh, visible light communication. Uh, in my talk today, I will go through the following uh, topics. I will start with an introduction about Li-Fi technology. What is it? Why do we need it? And what are the possible applications for this technology? Uh, I will then uh, talk a little bit about the current standardization efforts and market overview of Li-Fi. Uh, I will also talk about some uh, of the state-of-the-art implementation. And then I will talk about the concept of intelligent Wi-Fi, which could be enabled, enabled by the uh, emerging technology of intelligent reflecting uh, surfaces. I will then end my uh, talk with some uh, concluding remarks. So of course, we all know that wireless connectivity is now uh, a major part of our daily life. And without it, we cannot do many of the things that we depend on daily, such as social interactions on social media, video streaming, remote working, and all of that. And the question that we've been asking ourselves for a long time is, is radio frequency going to be sufficient to continue to support the wireless connectivity demands or not? And I think there is a consensus that the answer is no. Radio frequency resources will not be able to uh, suffice for the needs for future wireless communications. Uh, this figure here is a predictive uh, estimation of the uh, 
spectrum uh, radio resources that we will need uh, from the year 2025 until uh, the year uh, 2040. And the red uh, dashed line here, it shows uh, the current radio frequency available resources. And uh, we have an estimation for uh, a growth rate from 50% to 70%. And in the best case scenario, the current radio frequency resources will be sufficient uh, for the needs of wireless communications until around the year uh, 2030, uh, 2032 or 2034. And after that, we will have a surge on the demand of bandwidth, but we will not have available radio frequency resources to satisfy this need. And that's why now all the uh, communication uh, 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 research field is looking for alternatives for radio frequency resources, such as millimeter wave and also optical wireless communications. When we talk about optical wireless communications, it is a big and broad name and it contains difficult, different uh, technologies within it. We have free space optical communications and free space optical communication. Uh, it's actually an alternative for optical fiber, a wireless alternative, because optical, uh, uh, free space optical communication can support very high data rates over high distances uh, uh, using infrared communications. So it is a good uh, um, uh, solution for backhole wireless connectivity. We have also optical camera communication, uh, which uses visible light for transmission and uses camera as a detector. And because of the use of the camera, it can only offer low data rates over short distances. Uh, also under the uh, term of optical wireless communications, we have ultraviolet communications. And of course it's used ultraviolet lights, which can, which can actually uh, be uh, supportive of non-line of sight connectivity because ultraviolet communications could uh, be scattered and reflected through the environment. Uh, but the use of ultraviolet communication is restricted due to health concerns. Um, and the last but not least is Li-Fi technology. And Li-Fi depends on visible light communications and it is a fully networked solution. So it supports high data rate, it supports multi-user access mobility and also point to point and multiple access scenarios. So what is visible light communication? Visible light communication is a technology that uses a standard lighting infrastructure such as light emitting diodes or laser diodes in order to broadcast information. How is this done? This is done by changing the intensity of the uh, transmitting light at very rapid frequencies so that these uh, changes carry the information within them. And uh, this process is called intensity modulation and it is done at very high uh, frequency uh, rate. So it cannot be actually detected by the human eye, which means that we could utilize the lighting that we have everywhere in our buildings, in our offices, in the malls, in the airports, inside the aircraft to provide wireless connectivity without affecting the illumination function of these devices. And for reception at the receiver side, we will have a photo detector or uh, an image detector that could sense these fluctuations in the light intensity and transform these into current that's used for data detection. So this is visible light communication and based on it, we have the emerging concept of light fidelity or Li-Fi. So Li-Fi is a network solution, which means we can utilize multiple access points to support uh, data transmission to multiple users. We could support user mobility so that user can move from one access point to, a, to another without interruption in the data. And it supports high data rate bi-directional connectivity. So uplink and the downlink. Usually uplink is performed using IR and downlink using visible light communication. Why do we need Li-Fi or what are the advantages that can be offered by this technology? The first very obvious one is the high modulation bandwidth. We said that the radio frequency bandwidth will not be uh, available for us forever. At some point, it will not be able to, to satisfy the demands on wireless connectivity. And in the uh, visible light spectrum, we have uh, a huge unregulated bandwidth that we could utilize. If we look at the electromagnetic spectrum, the width of the visible light spectrum is more than 2000 times greater than the radio frequency and the millimeter wave ranges combined, which means we have a huge potential to utilize this unlicensed spectrum for wireless connectivity. The second advantage is extreme densification. We know that the key to future networks, to 6G and beyond, is the concept of very small cells. 
because this will allow us to serve multiple users in the same location. And invisible light communication, because the coverage area of the light is actually um, is confined within a small area. It's only like a coverage of few meters in diameter, which means that we can actually have very small cells adjacent next to each other. So we allow very high user densification and of course, very high capacity. The third advantage is high physical layer security. The advantage of light is that light does not um, go through uh, walls, for example. So the light can be confined within our room, which means that there is no way for eavesdroppers outside of the coverage area to be able to intercept our communication link. So it is an inherent physical layer security feature. And the fourth advantage is, of course, it does not propose any electromagnetic interference. So this means that we could safely utilize it in environments where it's, there is a sensitivity for electromagnetic radiation, such as in industrial plants, in factories, on aircrafts, and so on and so forth. Some of the real life applications that show the potential of this technology and that it's not a blue sky research kind of thing because I remember when I started working on uh, visible light communications, and I'm sure Diana recalls as well, whenever we talk to anyone about visible light communication, it sounded like a science fiction kind of thing. But actually, that's not the case. Now, after more than uh, maybe two decades of research on this technology, it is a reality. And it's being actually applied in, in, in on a very large scale in some, uh, in some scenarios. And now I will present some uh, of these uh, applications. The first application is defense and cybersecurity. And this is not only because light signals are uh, physically secure, but also because they are very highly reliable, which means that we could rely on these in disaster uh, management and in defense applications. Uh, here I have a screenshot of uh, BBC News last year, which uh, announced that uh, the US Army has uh, made a deal with a Scottish, uh, a Scottish uh, startup, which is Pure Li-Fi in Edinburgh. This was a three million pounds deal to uh, include the Li-Fi communication in the commander's toolbox. Um, also, it is very interesting for Navy communication, and there is current work in the US Navy in order to include Li-Fi, because Li-Fi is not only good for free space communications, but also for underwater communications, because we know that light transfers through the underwater media much better than uh, radio frequency resources. And for this reason, it is very suitable for in-ship, ship-to-ship, ship-to-submarine, and ship-to-shore communications. Uh, the second application is Li-Fi on board or Li-Fi on the aircraft. We all know, we've all been there, that wireless connectivity on the aircraft is not uh, the best that we could have. And that's because implementing radio frequency connectivity comes with so many uh, obstacles, such as providing the infrastructure on plate, uh, what kind of resources, radio frequency resources, uh, are being licensed for the use on uh, the aircraft. And for this reason, the use of Li-Fi technology is very handy on airplanes. First of thing, first thing is that we are using the lighting infrastructure inside the plane. For example, we are using the lights in the cabin, the reading lights in the cabin, in order to provide connectivity. So we do not need to add equipment, and we know that um, adding anything to the aircraft, is, it's, 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 a, it's not an easy thing because you know the weight is, is a big problem. So the first thing, we are utilizing an equipment that's already there. The second thing, we are utilizing unlicensed spectrum. So it could be used any, uh, where in the world, regardless of the geographical location of the airplane, it is confined inside um, the airplane. There is no kind of interference. The third thing is it will not um, interfere with the uh, operation in, uh, inside the plane. So we know that we have to turn our mobiles on, uh, off, sorry, during takeoff and during landing uh, because it interferes with the uh, operation inside uh, the uh, airplane. This will not be the case if we use Li-Fi because we're just using the light. And uh, for these reasons, Li-Fi on the aircraft is a very appealing solution. Actually, Air France has uh, partnered with uh, Olitcom, which is an, uh, a company 
company that works on Li-Fi communications, and they announced that they have a Li-Fi connection of one gigabit per second over a commercial flight in 2019. More recently, in 2021, Airbus has announced that they are including an in-flight entertainment kit based on Li-Fi. And actually, they have announced it in the uh, Dubai Air Show in November 2021. And this is a, a, a screenshot from uh, Airbus website. So actually, it is a smart Li-Fi monitor that promises to have the same experience that you would have on the ground, but uh, on board. And uh, using Li-Fi, we could have 4K ultra high definition streaming, as well as uh, localization using the light inside the cabin. So this shows the potential of Li-Fi in such applications. The third application is Industry uh, 4.0, because we know that Industry 4.0 is based on automation in all layers of the manufacturing process. And in order to have automation, we need to have intelligent machines, but we also need to have very high rel reliable connectivity between the machines. And also we need to have very precise localization. Li-Fi system can provide two of these components. They can provide the reliable uh, and uh, uh, low delay connectivity. And also they can provide localization because we could utilize the lighting as well to estimate uh, the uh, location of the equipment. So it is very uh, appealing for use in, life, uh, in industry 4.0 applications. Here I have a screenshot from uh, from Hoover uh, website. They have uh, showed this demonstration of a Li-Fi GigaDoc, and this one actually can provide up to 12.5 gigabits per second connectivity using light over very short distances uh, of few centimeters with very low latency, less than one nano. Um, second. And this is very appealing for uh, connectivity demands and manufacturing automation. The fourth application that I will speak about today is Li-Fi for autonomous and connected cars. We know that already we have the lamps in the car, we have the lighting there, we just need to add a module for modulation and a module for detection, and then we can have a connectivity between cars. And of course, there is no need to say that we need the extreme uh, reliability and low delay in such, uh, in such scenarios when we talk about autonomous cars. Uh, here I have also a collaboration between Fraunhofer and a mobile uh, uh, network provider in Japan. And actually they have utilized the lightings uh, of the lamps in trucks, uh, autonomous trucks, self-driving trucks, and they have demonstrated a very um, successful pilot uh, study using Li-Fi communications. So the applications do not stop here. There are so many other uh, uh, domains, such as uh, the use in space communications, integrated air, space, terrestrial communications, uh, the, the use in underwater communications, because as I said, the light can, uh, can uh, uh, propagate very effectively in these mediums. Of course, in hospitals and surgical uh, theaters, because we do not have interference with electromagnetic interference, and also definitely anything that requires very high data rates, such as augmented and virtual reality applications. So this is uh, uh, um, when it comes to the technology and uh, the, uh, the possible applications. What about the standardization? Uh, it is actually not as, um, as new as, 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 as you might think, because there have been some standard, standardization efforts starting from the year 2011. Uh, the first standard, which is the IEEE 802.15.7 in 2011, uh, specified the physical layer and MAC layer specifications uh, for visible light communication and uh, uh, the specifications for the dimming support and the flickering mitigation. In 2018, there was um, a modification for the short range optical wireless communications that now uh, were uh, standardized to support uh, mobility uh, of uh, the users, as well as uh, uh, address to impairments due to the noise and interference, for example, from the ambient light. And into the, uh, the, the latest one that's now being actually developed and finalized, it is the multi gigabits per second optical wireless communication standard. And this one aims to uh, support multi gigabit per second at uh, high distances in the range of 200 meters. And the standardization efforts that are being uh, implemented for this uh, standard through also the Light uh, uh, Alliance uh, involves so many different uh, stakeholders, including internet providers, service providers, uh, Li-Fi manufacturing companies, uh, as well as um, lighting infrastructure manufacturing uh, companies. Um, 
Also, there is a standard uh, that is um, um, an amendment to the uh, Wi-Fi IEEE 802.11 standard. So it aims to utilize the current uh, mature technology and just shift it in order to be utilized for Wi-Fi uh, communications. When we talk about the market for Wi-Fi, it is a huge market because it um, involves people from different uh, sectors. We are talking about lights that are supposed to provide internet connectivity for end users. So the main players in this play will be the lighting infrastructure providers. And for example, we saw that Philips has uh, announced the establishment of a new uh, uh, branch of, of the company, which is called Signify, which is just um, focused on providing manufacturing lights with uh, Li-Fi capabilities. Uh, the other uh, player will be the optical components uh, uh, provider, the Li-Fi uh, products provider, companies such as Pure Li-Fi and Oletcom. Uh, also, of course, we need to involve the utility and application uh, providers such as Tesalat and Do so that they could offer this service to the uh, users. And of course, there is the research and development organizations um, across industry and across uh, academic institutions who continuously contribute to the uh, development and the standardization status of this technology. Here I have a screenshot from a mortar intelligence uh, survey, which uh, presents the insights for the Li-Fi uh, market. And the market globally was valued at around $300 million uh, in 2020 and is expected to reach $4,000 million in the year 2026. I will now talk about some of the state-of-the-art implementations. Uh, in this publication that we uh, uh, published uh, recently, uh, this year, uh, we demonstrate a 10 gigabit per second uh, optical link based on width uh, length division multiplexing and using micro LEDs. Uh, so in this figure, we have here uh, the representation of the one of the LED arrays, which contains uh, eight uh, different uh, LEDs. And here we see when one of them only in operation. We have uh, here a plot of uh, the three uh, different wavelengths that we are utilizing. We are utilizing wavelength in the ultraviolet uh, uh, light. We have the UVA and UVB and UVC. And we see here the power versus current and the voltage versus current for each of these uh, wavelengths, as well as the central frequency. And now this is the concept of the, uh, the basic concept of the experiment where we have wavelength division multiplexing. So we have three different LEDs micro LEDs, each one um, transmits in, in a specific wavelength and the UVC, UVB, and UVA. And in order to combine the three wavelengths, we utilize here two uh, dichronic matters. So these can also, can only reflect uh, light in a certain wavelength and allow the other wavelengths to pass. And for this reason here, we have the red line that could be reflected. The blue line is passing. And in this mechanism, the three different wavelengths can be combined and then transmitted over the optical medium. At the receiver, we will have something similar. Also, we utilize two, chronic, two dichronic mirrors in order to uh, uh, extract the three different wavelengths. So of course, each one of these wavelengths will carry uh, separate information. And that's why when we do wavelength division multiplexing, we could utilize higher data rate than if we are using uh, one of them. And this figure, we show the bit error rate versus the data rate for the three devices separately. And I want to mention that when we did this, we also, um, when, we, we, when we activate one of the LEDs, we allow the other two LEDs to produce some kind of noise in order to take into consideration realistic scenarios. So at this bit, bit error rate, which is around, I believe, three or four uh, times 10 to the power minus three, uh, we can see the achievable data rate for each of them. Uh, so for the UVC, we reach a data rate of around 4.1 gigabits per second. For the UVB, we reach around three, and for the UVA, around 3.2 gigabits per second. So the aggregate data rate of these three uh, micro LEDs is more than 10 gigabits per second. And this is the kind of implementation that we are talking about that could achieve very high data rates using commercial um, LEDs. 
So the talk is about intelligent Li-Fi. We talked about Li-Fi, the applications, the state of the art, the kind of, uh, of um, uh, data rates that we could accomplish. Why do we need intelligent Li-Fi? What is missing? The missing is that there are still some obstacles that face the uh, large scale implementation of this technology. The first obstacle is the limited bandwidth of the LEDs. We talked before that the optical bandwidth is, is a huge, it's 2,000 times greater than the radio frequency bandwidth. But this does not mean that each separate LED could utilize this bandwidth because, of course, each LED has a specific modulation bandwidth that we could not exceed. So the first obstacle that we have is we need much better uh, transmitting light diodes or um, laser diodes so that we can have a higher bandwidth and achieve much higher data rates than we currently have. Uh, the second problem that we have is that uh, the line of sight affects our communications because it is visible light, it does not penetrate through obstacles. So in order for me to connect to this light, for example, I will need a direct line of sight between the transmitter and the receiver. If there is a blockage because of any reason, if someone is walking, whatever, if there is any reason that's blocking me from the light, my link will stop. Of course, this is not the aim, this is not good enough. We need uh, ubiquitous connectivity even if the line of sight does not exist. So this is the second problem that we need to overcome. And the third problem is that when we have multiple input, multiple output scenarios, they do not perform uh, very well currently in Li-Fi, and we will see the reason uh, shortly, but mainly it's because of the high channel correlation between uh, the MIMO uh, uh, subchannels. And the solution for this is to implement intelligent Li-Fi systems to equip both the uh, signal processing uh, stage, the transmitter's physical layer, transmitter and receiver, and also the environment with the intelligence that is able to optimize and reconfigure the performance of Li-Fi in order to overcome all of these limitations and take us to a new place of much higher, more reliable ubiquitous connectivity. So the concept that comes into play here is the concept of intelligent reflecting surfaces. They are also called reconfigurable intelligent surfaces or software defined meta surfaces. All these terms that we have been hearing uh, lately in the literature, they refer to a technology where um, surfaces manufactured from uh, meta atoms could be engineered in order to produce a specific electromagnetic response to the incident wave, and thus they control the propagation of the light inside the environment. So although this topic is very new, but we have some material to start uh, from because the, uh, the uh, ability of some uh, metasurface materials to manipulate light is already well studied in the field of uh, flat optics. And we have actually uh, research outcomes that show that there are metasurfaces that could produce different engineered response to different kinds uh, of situations that could uh, 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 provide uh, anomalous reflection um, to control the reflection area of a light beam that could provide a re a refractive index tuning so we could achieve uh, a variable refractive index depending on how much we want to absorb and to reflect. We could uh, provide light intensity control, amplification, attenuation, or absorption, and as well as with length decoupling, which is very interesting for the application that I talked about before, which is with length division and multiplexing. So the first part is if we want to equip our transceivers, the transmitter and the receiver, with a kind of intelligence because of the meta surfaces. The first application is uh, beam steering. We said that the uh, communication link in Li-Fi depends on the line of sight between the transmitter and the receiver. So if the user is a little bit outside of the coverage area of the LED, it could uh, receive only very low light intensity and the coverage and the data rate will not be enough maybe to satisfy the quality of service demands for this user. If we have a meta surface lens fixed to the LED that could be actually uh, manipulated in order to control how is the light transmitted, then we could adjust it according to the varying parameters in the environment. For example, if the user is exactly under the coverage area, we could reduce the uh, width of the beam in order to provide much higher data rate concentrate to this user. 
uh, if the user is outside the coverage area, we could direct the beam by controlling the refractive index and the reflection of the light in order to concentrate um, the light to the user. The second uh, application is dynamic angular diversity. One of the uh, transmitter and receiver configurations in LiFi is angular diversity, where we have multiple transmitting LEDs fixed at the transmitter, and sometimes also multiple photodetectors fixed at, at the receiver. The advantage of this is to provide small beams to support different users without interference. However, if this configuration is fixed, it's not always guaranteed to be able to satisfy uh, the demands of the network. For example, a user could exist between the overlapping area of two different beams. So actually, instead of having a solution, we are having a problem because this user will need to mitigate the interference. If these uh, small angular diversity transmitters are equipped with dynamic reconfigurable metasurface lenses, then we could also adjust the beam concentration in order to reduce the interference and offer the best possible equality of service for the users. The third application is related to the uh, implementation that I showed before, which is wavelength division multiplexing. Uh, we said before that we use diachronic mirrors in order to reflect a certain wavelength and allow the other wavelength uh, to, uh, uh, to pass. And in this way, we combine and uh, we decombine the signal at the transmitter and the receiver. However, this configuration is a fixed configuration, which means that this mirror operates at a fixed wavelength. So it could be only utilized for a certain um, wavelength division multiplexing scheme. If it is, for example, RGB, combining red and green and blue lights, it will be fixed to this and it cannot be changed. However, if these diachronic mirrors are replaced by meta surfaces, then we could adjust the wavelength division multiplexing according to the um, requirements, sometimes according to the interference, we could adjust the amplification or attenuation of different lights in order to adjust the signal to interference and noise ratio and offer an optimized performance, which uh, leads to a higher uh, data rates for wavelength division multiplexing. Now, if we talk about implementing uh, reconfigurable intelligent surfaces on the walls, which is the vision for future uh, connectivity. now. All uh, or most of the current research on radio frequency, they assume that we, in the near future, we are going to have the concept of uh, reflective surfaces surrounding all walls, all buildings, some of the equipment that could actually manipulate the environment in order to enhance the connectivity. So if we have this concept here, we could assume, for example, if this user is, is, is uh, experiencing a line of sight blockage, in this case, because of the human body, if there is a surface that could be controlled in order to reflect the light to the user, then we could overcome the line of sight dependency uh, problem. Here we have some of the simulation results uh, that were published recently uh, that demonstrate um, the received signal to noise ratio versus the uh, uh, separation between the LED and the user in a room of a size eight by eight by three meters square. And uh, we have the dashed line here, they do not use a reflecting surface, and the uh, uh, continuous lines, they use a reflecting surface. And we have seen how does the SNR degrade in the case of uh, no uh, res, uh, especially if we introduce line of sight blockage, and especially if we introduce a mobile orientation. Because if I'm holding my mobile here and I'm connected through my camera, let's say, to this slide, if I the normal human behavior as I walk or as I'm reading or whatever, I will be moving my mobile. So the line of sight will be disrupted and the intensity of the signal will be uh, disrupted. So we modeled actually, um, based on uh, experimental values, we modeled uh, the distribution of the orientation of the mobile if the user is sitting or if the user is walking. And we saw that especially if the user is walking, the orientation of the device will cause a huge degradation in the uh, SNR at the user. However, if we introduce the use of uh, RES, we can see that there is a shift in the received SNR, and it will be always acceptable uh, at the user, even if we introduce link blockage and uh, device orientation. So this shows the um, uh, prospects of this technology to overcome the line of sight limitation in Li-Fi systems. The second problem is uh, 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 the coverage. If we use this, we can provide a more uh, a uniform coverage for the users. Because if I have a single light that's covering 
uh, this room, this will be the normal distribution of the light across the room. The user in the middle will have the highest received SNR or tunnel, tunnel uh, uh, strength. And the users uh, at the edge will uh, experience a much lower light intensity. And this means that um, if we are in a multi-cell scenario, the users at the edge will always experience very frequent handover, which is of course something that we don't want in a communication system. However, if we assume that we have, as, as we see here in the results, we assume that we have one deflecting surface of a side one meter by one meter on each of the four walls, and utilizing the reflections from re these surfaces, we could actually shift the entire uh, distribution of the received uh, signal, and we could satisfy the demands of the users even at the very um, extreme uh, locations at the edges uh, of the room in order to provide ubiquitous uh, connectivity and overcome this uh, limitation. Uh, the third uh, uh, um, uh, application for adaptive environments will be in uh, MIMO scenarios. And the reason behind that is different to RF, we don't have fading characteristics in the optical channel. And this means that if I have, let's say, two receivers here on the mobile, they both will experience very similar um, channel gains. And because of that, the use and the uh, spectral efficiency gains from MIMO, whether we are using MIMO for special uh, multiplexing or special modulation or repetition coding, the achievable uh, data rate enhancement can be limited. However, if we introduce a reflecting surface somewhere in the room that could manipulate the signal strength at one or two of these receivers, we could manipulate the channel gain and uh, the MIMO channel matrix in order to enhance the decorrelation and improve the uh, achievable uh, diversity gain or capacity gain of MIMO systems. Another application is in the field of non-orthogonal multiple axis. So non-orthogonal multiple axis uh, is actually a multiple axis uh, uh, scheme, different, for example, to OFDMA or TDMA. Uh, NOMA uh, allows user to be multiplex in the power domain by um, allocating different power levels to the different users. However, uh, always the performance in NOMA depends on having distinct channel gains for the users because the user with lower uh, channel intensity will have higher power value and vice versa. So if the two users, for example, are located in symmetric locations from the light, they will have very similar channel gains. So the performance of NOMA will be very, uh, the performance enhancement will be very limited. And for this reason, if we introduce uh, also a risk surface that could manipulate the channel gain, we can have a much higher um, uh, reliability and higher fairness in NOMA systems. This is a figure from a paper that was uh, uh, recently um, uh, published in uh, ICC just last month. Uh, and here we see the um, performance enhancement if we uh, imply intelligent reflecting surfaces. We formulated an optimization problem to jointly optimize the transmit power of the LED, the reflecting coefficients of the intelligent surface, and also uh, uh, the NOMA uh, decoding order. And based on that, we can see here that when, this is the bit error rate versus the transmit SNR, when we do not have reflecting surfaces, for example, in the blue line, we could see that the performance is not good at all because we assumed a worst case scenario and that the users exhibit very similar challenge conditions. If we add intelligent reflecting surfaces and also optimize the performance of the system and the reflecting surface, we could achieve much lower data rates up to 10 to the power minus six, uh, which means that definitely adding the intelligent reflecting surface could enhance the performance of NOMA. This is again the same uh, from the same paper. If we uh, add the random orientation or if we add the blockage problem, the performance will be very high and we will have an error rate, but with the introduction of intelligent reflecting surfaces, the performance is much better and we uh, achieve very acceptable error rates for our communication link. The last application I think that I will talk about will be in, in order to enhance the security. We said that already light is very secure, it cannot uh, penetrate the wall and go to the other room. So I'm safe from eavesdroppers from the other room. How about if the eavesdroppers are in the same location? We still have a problem because we need to secure our signal from potential malicious users inside the same coverage area. And in this, uh, in this uh, 
uh, area, we have now what is called physical layer sec security, which is opposite to, let's say, a crypt a cryptography or software uh, security, especially now that we're moving towards uh, quantum computers, cryptography may, might not be enough, and we need to physically secure our uh, transmissions. And some of the techniques that are used in physical layer security are uh, um, jamming, where we produce some of interference signals from another LED to interfere with the signal at the uh, malicious user, uh, secure beamforming for, for MIMO, and all of that. But when we want to implement this in visible light communications, we face the same problem, which is the high correlation between the optical channels. So if we introduce the reflecting surfaces that could optimally manipulate the reflection coefficients towards different users, we could enhance the performance and achieve much higher security. And actually, this is now a work in uh, progress that we are trying uh, to, uh, to finalize in order to prove that intelligent reflecting surfaces do offer a huge enhancement in the physical layer security of visible light communication systems. So now I will conclude uh, in this talk. I talked about Li-Fi technology. I talked why it is important and what it could offer to the current wireless uh, industry scene, and also that we could achieve much better performance if we introduce intelligence in the transmitter or in the receiver or in the environment itself in order to control and optimize the propagation of wave signals uh, to the users. I think there are many uh, opportunities for uh, research and implementation in this direction because we still do not have accurate uh, modeling and characterization as well as and fabrication for meta surfaces that work in uh, the wavelength of interest for our uh, communication links. Also, we need to work on more uh, cost-effective ways to obtain channel state information at the user in order to allow real-time optimization for different applications such as manufacturing and autonomous driving. Uh, of course, we need as well real-time optimization uh, uh, at the transmitter and the receiver, as well as the uh, reflecting surface. And we need to find a way to integrate this technology in dif across different uh, communication mediums, because we do not want to have a surface that works for RF and another surface that works for millimeter wave and another one that works for optical communications. Uh, I think a very um, promising research direction is to integrate uh, and uh, to fabricate meta surfaces that could work for different uh, wavelengths according to the technology that's being used. If you're interested to know more about this, I would invite you to have a look at our recently published book, which offers an introduction to optical wireless communications. Um, also, I would like to say that this work that we have been doing was, um, it was uh, uh, um, featured in LED's magazine, and our recently published magazine is also in the top 50 downloaded uh, articles uh, in the last four years in a row. So I would like to invite you to have a look at this. I hope you're finding, you'll find it interesting. Thank you so much again for having me uh, today, and I'm happy to answer any questions. I hope I did not uh, bore you so much <laughs> in this talk. Happy to answer your questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. And you can listen to my five, which is wonderful. So if you have any questions, please go ahead. I think we have one question on the Q&A, but you have to read it. Yeah? Yeah. Here in the chat. The Q&A. Oh, OK. Yeah. Not technical question? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, please. Okay, so, so that's from the uh, notification first, but uh, basically the Li Fi, uh, just correct me if I'm wrong, it basically transmits the information yeah. to the light. Yeah. And is it designed to like transmit the information directly to a specific user or it's like whoever is in the light? Yes. So thank you. So it could actually uh, operate in different modes. It could operate in a broadcast mode. So for example, there was a use case to use it in the museums. So where the light are broadcasting the same information for all users. So it's not like a dedicated, uh, a dedicated link. But of course, we have the normal uh, uh, dedicated links to users. So it could be uh, actually transmitting to a single user or to multiple users who can be multiplexed in the time domain or the frequency domain or the op or the power domain. So actually, it's a technology that could provide normal connectivity, such as like connecting to 3G or 4G or 5G now, whatever, uh, in the same in the same manner. Do you rely on MAC address to do that? Or the IP, how does it like direct the, uh, the 
the message to a specific device. Yes, yes, it will it will utilize the IP. Yeah. It's basically like up there, but can you identify just the, the yeah. <laughs> Just the physical medium is different, but yeah. the authentication is the same. Should could be the same. So basically, whatever security uh, the protocols can also be applied. Exactly. Yes. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, thank you for the question. Of course, the trans of course, the propagation of light underwater is different than uh, free space. But when we talk about optical signals, uh, bear in mind we're not talking about visible light only. We are not talking about visible light, infrared, ultraviolet. And also, we are, when we compare it to radio frequency or to acoustic waves, it achieves much better propagation. So it's not as good as in free space, but compared to other technologies, it actually it's proven to offer higher data rates for longer distances. Yes, please. Thank you. Yes, please. Physics department lab, and that yeah, part, yeah, uh, as well as and yes, 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 an ideal environment. Dark environment. Yeah. But what about what kind of system? Yes. Thank you for the questions. Okay. Yeah, sure. I'll do that. So the first question was uh, the role of uh, antenna fabrication as well as the physics department in this research. Thank you for the question. Actually, this is an interdisciplinary research team because we are working on signal processing, we are working on communications, we are working on machine learning because these surfaces are supposed to be intelligent, but also we are working on the meta surface fabrication, which where comes, I think, the physics department and uh, uh, the manufacturing. Uh, in our uh, communication sensing and imaging group, we have a group that's focused on antenna fabrication, and they are currently fabricating meta surfaces that work in the radio frequency resources. And the, the next step for us is to fabricate antennas and intelligent surfaces, meta surfaces that work on the optical, uh, in the optical wavelength. Uh, for the second question, um, yeah, for the setup for the experiment, how is the setup for the experiment? So actually there are different, it depends on the, on the, on, on the setup. Here in this uh, experiment that I showed, it utilizes uh, UV micro LEDs. For this reason, there was no need for it to be in a dark room. So it was a normal setup over short distances in the lab. Sometimes when we use visible light communications, we try to do it in a dark room. So we have a dark room that's like absolutely dark. So we have no interference from the light. And uh, so that we can see in an ideal environment, how, will our, uh, will our, how our system is going, uh, is going to work. Does this answer your question? Yes. Of course, of course. It always starts in the dark room where you achieve the maximum performance, and then you move it to a normal setup where you have now to deal with the uh, interference from light. Usually, most of the interference from ambient light could be filtered out using normal filters, and there will be just a, a small degradation to the optimal performance. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much for you're most welcome. Thank you. Yes. Yes. So thank you for the question. So this is a sim simulation results. Uh, of course, we aim to much. Uh, lower uh, uh, bit error rates, but this is to show, uh, uh, to show the kind of, of, uh, of performance then that we could offer. Like even in the experimental uh, demonstration that I showed, we assume that our target bit error rate is in the range of 10 to the power minus a three. Of course, in the 
communication systems of the future, we need a much lower bit error rate. But this is for demonstration uh, demonstration purposes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I be, I believe I believe yeah I believe this this technology will be uh, I mean it is now a reality in some use cases as I as I showed but I will I believe it will be an every an everyday and like a uh, normal uh, consumer uh, uh, available in the in the in the in the in the, in the, in the near future. The reason behind that is I I, I said that Philips are already now heavily involved. I think they started just before the pandemic. They are heavily involved in manufacturing um, Li-Fi equipped lights. So on a larger scale, this means that most of the lights that are going now to be implemented will have this feature. There are different countries now. I think there are like many, like tens of, uh, tens of, uh, of, of, of startups uh, and companies in different countries across Europe and the US that are focused on manufacturing Li-Fi enabled lights. So I believe very soon we will be see uh, we will see this technology. There was actually an implementation from um, from Huawei on a mobile phone. Yes. It wasn't like a, like a pilot, like to utilize the normal camera and the mobile phone in order to receive uh, the Li-Fi uh, communication. So I think I don't know. Maybe in a, in ten years time, <laughs> it will be an everyday gadget. <laughs> Yes. When it comes to the implementation, uh, we have Philips in uh, Singapore. They always implemented Lattice in vulnerable application using Wi-Fi. Also, they implemented the vulnerable into a localization in one of the supermarkets here in the middle. So if you are interested to see how this works, they actually have an implementation here in the middle. That's good to know. Yeah. <laughs> actually, there. Yeah. yeah. Yes, go ahead, Victoria. Thank you. Thank you. Because we are actually like Yes. So this is usually Yeah. So no, no, there isn't a prototype available for a Li-Fi uh, yet. As I said, we are working now on implementing the fabrication of optical meta surfaces. There are many challenges different to RF that are uh, related to having this technology and the optical. I think there are so many uh, research groups that are working on it. Until now, no, the, to answer your question, sure, there is no prototype. But as, I, uh, as I, I showed before, there are many research publications in the area of flat optics that show actually we could, we could implement uh, this technology. But how to make it reconfigurable, that's, that's a question. And this is actually one very, very interesting research direction at the moment. Thank you. Thank you. That's true. <laughs> That's true. It depends, of course, on uh, the, the. I mean, in, in the pocket, of course, you will not get a signal because it's totally it's totally blocked. But there were some uh, experiments showing that you could receive uh, a meaningful data rate if the light is dimmed, like to a very low level. And still, you could you could sense the fluctuations. If it's totally blocked, the receiver is totally blocked. Of course, you cannot see it. But we are talking about a normal scenario where your mobile phone or your um, laptop can see the light, and there will be occasional blockage because of the movement or whatever. Then we have some solutions for it. But I just want to mention that Li-Fi is not supposed to replace Wi-Fi or 6G or 5G or whatever. It is a supporting technology. So definitely, we will have Wi-Fi and uh, 5G and 6G, and we will have this supporting technology to offer, uh, let's say, higher user densification on a lower level, as well as in some applications where we cannot use uh, electromagnetic or radio frequency uh, communications. Now, uh, because there is an online site, uh, communication for Wi-Fi, so they are using the reflected light, and they are using the reflected light, so it doesn't have to be that. So even if your device is under the table, it still gives the signal. 
from the light reflected around the glass. So this area was somehow yeah. sold. Yeah. But the only thing is, I wanted to know which one is sold. It's switched to, uh, to, to Wi Fi. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> Purposes to the mm -hmm. which I interested Yeah. Follow. Yeah. Because that's, I think, more appropriate. Yes. Uh, back in my mind, yes. Because I might want to pack up for one. Yes. And put it like this. Yes. Uh, so, what do you think? Is it, do you, are, are you aware of the past? Yes. Yes. I, yeah. Thank you so much for the question. This is also a very interesting research uh, application, which is SWIFT, uh, simultaneous wireless communications and power transfer. It exists in RF, but it also has very high potential to be very successful in Li-Fi communications, because we already have the transmit power that we receive to decode the information. So actually what, what, what is being done in the research is that you, you um, you divide the power of your, of, of your transmit light. Some of the power is used for data transmission. The other part is used for, for wireless communication. I'm aware of, I didn't work on this, but I'm aware of some, uh, of some uh, research in this, in this area. Um, similar to it, actually, there is now a, a move towards utilizing solar panels in order to do um, energy harvesting plus free space optical communications. So of course, the solar panel is, could be receiving the light, not only from the sun, but could be receiving the light from some free space optical transmitters. And this light could be used for uh, energy harvesting as well as uh, 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 modulation, yeah, communication. Thank you. Thanks. Yes, we have actual questions. Oh, OK. Oh, no, <laughs> not at all. Uh, there is a question about uh, some modulation or uh, signal processing techniques that could enhance the underwater communication. I believe all the modulation techniques that we are talking about, such as OFDM uh, and the implementation of OFDM, I think that could enhance the visible light uh, communication in the free space could, could also uh, implemented in, uh, in the underwater. The problem is that we have much uh, higher uh, uh, path loss, and that's why we need uh, to, to boost the performance. But I'm not aware that there are specific underwater modulation uh, techniques for, uh, for, this, for this environment. Um, regarding no, yeah. Uh, there is a question about Noma. Um, uh, I think uh, she says that I couldn't understand this application. Noma is non-orthogonal multiple axis. We know frequency division multiple axis. We know time division multiple axis, code division multiple axis. You are allowing users to be connected by allocating different frequency resources. In Noma, this frequency resource is power. So you are allocating different power values to the users and you are imposing the power values and transmitting the signal at the same time. It's hard to uh, explain the, the, the whole concept now, but I would encourage you to uh, check some of uh, our publications on non-orthogonal multiple axis, so it could be, uh, it could be uh, easier to uh, understand. Basically, it is power domain multiplexing at the transmitter and successive interference cancellation at the receiver. There is a question about intensity modulation, if it affects the lighting system itself. Uh, it is not supposed to. As I talked in the standardization, there are very strict requirements uh, for, the, uh, um, for the flicker mitigation, which means that the modulation of the light has to be at very high modulation rate that cannot be per perceived by the human eye. So the illumination function is not affected. Can you talk about uh, visible light? Uh, I don't understand the question. I'm sorry. Wave length is short. What's me? I don't understand. It says when you talk. Discussing the wavelength. Yeah. I mean, the wavelength depends, of course, on the transmitting uh, module. We could use light emitting diodes, laser diodes, as I saw I said before, uh, ultraviolet. So um, the wavelength depends on the transmitting module. Um, a question about 5G or 6G will enable Li-Fi. I believe uh, the direction now is that Li-Fi will be uh, will be integrated 
uh, in 6G, whether it is at the, the early stages or at the later stage. But I believe LiFi will be integrated in 6G uh, and because of the many um, applications that we saw as well as the market insights. I believe that this is where the technology is, is going. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you so much again for having me here today. It was really nice to, uh, to visit the university and uh, to present to you. Thank you so much.